This is a test of the emergency broadcast system. Five. Check for sound. Four. It's showtime. Three. Let's two, go. One. You're listening to the Pro Audio Suite, a program for audio and voiceover professionals. Welcome to another Pro Audio Suite. Minus Robbo this week, he seems to have gone paywall. But uh, in the meantime, it's uh, over to the guys in the States, Robert and George. Morning, chaps, or afternoon. Hello. Now, this week we have uh, a special guest from the UK, um... The lovely Helen Lloyd will be talking about her career. She's quite well known for doing audio books, but um, she's also a well-trained actress and has many, many stories to tell. But uh, one thing I was going to talk to you about was um, setting up your home studio today. If you're doing audio books, what kind of setup would work? And are there any tips for editing? Oh, boy. Well, Robert, I mean, mm. I, I know what my experience is with audiobook narration. I haven't done it myself, but of course, I've helped people set it up, learn how to do it, trained them. I've edited audiobooks and mastered them. So I've dealt with them a lot. Um, but before I like totally bogart the conversation, um, Robert, what's your experience actually with that side of the world? So I have not had to specifically record an audio book. I've done plenty of very long form recordings of all types. So I think it's generally the same process. Um, and I would think that from my approach, at least, I would take an edit on the fly approach because uh, I wouldn't want to have to review it all so much. So if there's a take, like I would almost take um, like kind of almost a musical approach to it. So if there's a thing that you flub, you either are good at picking up and then you know saying it again, but then you have to go back and remember that. So you're almost better off just stopping and putting your edit point right where you want to pick up and pre-roll into it, read along with yourself and continue. Yep. So that would be my personal approach to that is just try to get it as much done in real time, literally as possible. I would think that with audiobooks, from a technique point of view, uh, I would minimize my breath so that I didn't have to deal with that from an editorial point of view. And they are kind of part of the, the read and the atmosphere. So I think in that genre, it's more okay than a commercial read. And I would just try to deal with everything as much as possible on the front end. Get rid of all my mouth clicks. <laughs> yeah. For sure. I don't think I would process down on the fly, though. That's just my own preference as far as, but I could see even that being part of it. You know, you could set up your chain and just almost go for a mastered recording, or close to mastered, where you just have to kind of do a final normalize, but your overall EQ, you know, high pass filter, compression is all sort of basically baked in but you have to be fairly confident about your setup yeah do it that way confident about your setup and confident about just your own technique are you how consistent yeah. are your levels how consistent on mic are you and that kind of thing yeah audiobook recording is a, is a unique beast and and of course it depends on genre but it it varies widely from extremely low quality very dry boring stuff for like reading for the blind to you know, full-blown dramatic reads. And the, I think the pinnacle of audiobook recording for me or, or audiobook acting would have to be Jim Dale, who narrated the entire um, Harry Potter audiobook series. Oh, my God. Yes, it, yes, it is. Um, that English actor, yeah. I know Jim you Dale. Mean. And yeah. I got to hear him interviewed live on a panel at That's VoiceOver. It's a conference every year. It was in New York City years ago. And hearing him describe what how the challenges involved in doing that book was pretty mind-blowing especially because he was not permitted to read the book in its in its entirety before he started the book so why not the reason was was because they were co they were concurrently releasing the audiobook with the release of the books which is very unusual and so and the manuscripts were in under such incredible lock and key they would only let him have one chapter or one section at a, at a time. Wow. So he would, and he voice, you know, he does in essence, a unique character for every, a unique voice for every character, or at least unique within the confines of an audiobook. And again, audiobook is a unique genre. It's not like a theater production where every single character has to be completely and utterly unique, but they all have to be somewhat distinguishably different. And that book probably had a hundred characters in it. And the challenge that you would have is if 
He came up with a voice for one character, and then later on in, the ch- in another chapter, he created another voice for another character. And if those two voices were exactly the same or very, very similar, and then those two characters end up meeting in chapter 17 and have a conversation, well, you got problems. Yeah. <laughs> you can't have a conversation <laughs> wow. between two characters with the same voice. So, my good fast, yeah. I mean, the guy is brilliant. He's obviously a, a titan of the genre. But that's an extreme case, but that's the range, you know, in skill level and, and production value. But in terms of the way a lot of the audiobooks are recorded these days in the States are through something called ACX, yeah, which is the Audiobook Creation Exchange. And what that is, is they've created a way that anybody with a book can get it recorded by any talent who wants to subject themselves or, or become part of this system of producing an audiobook. What happens is the audiobook, the, the actor becomes the producer. So they have to handle the entire production process. Now, whether they outsource stuff or whether they do it all themselves is up to them. But what tends to happen, and this is incredibly timely, by the way, this topic, because I'm literally sandwiched between two phone calls. This, what we're doing now, I'm sandwiched between two phone calls with an actor who I am training on how to record an audiobook. So oh, it's great wow. timing. Yeah, perfect. But it requires a tremendous amount of discipline and focus and organization and consistency. And you just have to be very just knuckled down in terms of how you place your mic. Your environment has to be under control. It can't, can, can't change all the time where the noise floor is 10 dB different one day than another. And God forbid you have to record pickups, which you always do. Then when you record the pickups, the environment has to match. So you yeah. have to have the you really have to have a very good, consistent recording space. Whatever the noise and floor is, it has to, yeah. Your performance has to be consistent and your studio has to be consistent. So those are two things that make it very difficult. And the thing is, a lot of people who have an acting background or don't even have an acting background, just they heard about audiobooks or they've listened to audiobooks and thought, I've always wanted to record audiobooks. They kind of get thrust into it thinking, this is my way in. But it's got to be one of the hardest ways to break into recording anything voiceover because you have to learn how to do everything from soup to nuts. I, I've heard nightmares about it where people kind of get committed to these basically contracts and, and they don't really know what it means to provide mastered material. And then they just get completely in the weeds of editing and you know just the overall scope sometimes of just having to record a 600-page book. It's a lot of voice work to begin with, and you're not even counting the real scope of all the editing. And I can't imagine if you get the sort of the wrong client who maybe gets too persnickety with the editing or something, and um, it seems like it could be a can of worms in many yeah. situations. Well, I just did a documentary series um, recently, but I didn't do it from here, which was a good thing. So I you know, was in a professional studio with the client on one end, and uh, an engineer sitting on the other side of the glass, which for me was perfect because I couldn't think of anything worse than being stuck on your own in your own studio. No one's actually listening to make sure that you're actually reading what's on the page. Right. That borders on hell. Mm -hmm. So hats off to anyone that does it, I've got to say. Oh, I mean, I I just, uh, more timeliness. Uh, We just had on our show voiceover body shop on uh, Monday. We just had Scott Brick, who is an extremely prolific voice uh, uh, audiobook narrator. His count is somewhere in the 850 books range. Um, wow. Averaging about one a week. Wow. And I mean, you know, he's at the point where he doesn't even audition anymore, right? I mean, they just hire him because they want Scott Brick. And, um, but he doesn't pre read the book, he has somebody else pre read the book. So he hires a person to pre read the book and sort of outline what it is that he has to expect in the book so he's ready and knows what to expect in terms of characters and all that. So he's figured out how to outsource even the pre-read of the book so that he can, you know, be the most efficient of his with his time he possibly can, which is pretty amazing because that's one of the things they tell you as an audiobook narrator is, of course, you have, you know, especially when you're a beginner or if it's a, um, especially a fiction, that you have to pre-read the book. So however long you think it's going to take to record the book, double it because you have to read the book first. So um, it's an incredible time investment. And, and it, the way people get paid is usually by the finished hour. So if you're really lucky, you might get $500 per finished hour. If you're a really experienced, very well sought after 
audiobook narrator. But to get a finished hour, what are you, three hours into it? Well, yeah. At I mean, least. it depends on how much of the work you're doing. Again, if you are just simply doing punch and roll recording, as they call it, and so you're editing on the fly, like you said, and so all you have to do is deliver a wave file with the punch and roll into the editor, and that's it, then that's obviously, the, that's the gravy side of recording audiobooks. And I mean, the perfect world, the really... It, I mean, as, as Andrew said, going to a studio and now even having to touch a computer is really the nicest way to go. I mean, just walk in, walk out. Yeah, but, the, but then, you're, then you're 500 bucks an hour, $100 if it goes to a studio. Well, again, that depends I mean, on whether can... it's being produced by a major publisher who's paying for all of that or whether it's through something like uh. ACX. And with ACX, you, the a talent, are the producer. So you negotiate that hourly rate and trust me, some of them are stipend or have none at all. Some of them are what they call royalty share, which is basically spec. And you do the whole book royalty share and you hope you make something on the sale of the book. And that's only, and that's only off the audio recording. That's not off the book. Right. This is just yeah. off the audio recording. This is how audiobook narrators tend to cut their teeth is working and buy some right. spec. The spec work. So they yeah. can put in right. a 10 hour audiobook. They can invest 50 to 100 hours recording that book. And they just don't, they're not ready for the time investment that they're going to be putting in. So anyway, I teach them to hone it down so that they can really become more efficient and not waste their time. If they're used to recording commercials, when you do a 30 second spot, you agonize over every, over every breath, word, yeah. syllable. Yeah. You can't oh, do the that. Gone. <laughs> you, don't, you don't agonize over those. Those are like deleted. Right. But with an <laughs> audiobook, it's the exact opposite. If you agonize over anything, good i mean forget it you can't you can't especially a long book i mean there's just no time so it's pretty pure i mean it's pure acting you have to just be good at reading good at cold reading be really consistent it's it's definitely one of the the closest thing to stage acting in the voiceover world i think so you're taking something off a page and creating a character out of thin air sometimes a lot of times and you're just going with the performance you don't have a lot of time to keep on you know finessing every little thing because then you'll end up, you know, with a lot of editing to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the kiss of death for an actor who doesn't know how to edit. So, yeah. I, I mean, I always tell people, are you, as voice actors go, are you a better voice actor or are you a better editor? If you're really great at editing, like many of us engineer people are, all right, then maybe, you know, record it with lots of flubs because you know you can fix it pretty fast. But that's not the case for most voice actors. They're going to be much better reading it properly the first time than trying to piece it together later. So... So the whole, the whole punch yeah. and roll, is a, that's a debate. Some voice actors say it's the only way to go. Others say I would never do that. And they use something like a, they make a mouth click or they use a dog training. Actually, I have one here. They'll, they'll be recording yeah, they along go, and they go like that. Yeah, yeah. Right. So yeah. they see the waveform exactly. and they can then. And you yep. do your first but then, edit. but then you still have to go review everything and. Um, well, you know, you, you still have to rewind, find it, make, you know, you're, you're clicking, you're putting your cursor here, picking your in point, yeah. picking your out point, and you're revisiting that moment in time where you're like, oh, that was wrong. Yeah. And as soon as you go, oh, that was wrong, you immediately know where your edit point is. You're going back, you're just doing it. And yeah. I would definitely advocate for punch and roll. I'm actually curious as to what systems people prefer for punch and roll. I'm very unfamiliar with, for example, Twisted Wave, but... That one would scare me because it doesn't really have a region-based system, so it's destructive. literally like destructive. Yeah, that's oof. well. I, I mean, I <laughs> I have taught or set up people to record audiobooks and most of the DAWs that are out there at this point. And Twisted Wave is still a favorite because it's so easy to edit in, but it does not have a native punch and roll function at all. And people have tried to hack it to do it, but it just doesn't do it. So what about um what yeah. about WaveLab Steinberg? You know what? I used to be a WaveLab user way, 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 way back. And I haven't used it in a long, long time, but I'm not aware of its ability to do punch and roll. But I do know it's a great editor and it would probably be perfectly at home at recording and editing, you know, audio for this stuff. Um, Yeah. But in terms of that function of being able to pick up a punch in point, pre-roll three seconds and keep on chugging, um, there's not only, you know, you have to have a true multi-track DAW software. You have to have Pro Tools or Studio One, or Reaper. Um, yeah. And I know audiobook I mean, people I like that use all of those. Because, <laughs> I mean, the whole ability to pre-roll into your punch is key because then you can pick your edit point 
you can pre-roll in and you can hear yourself as you go into it. That's right. And then the trick, which is just like a musician does, and this is where I think anybody who's a musician would just be like, easy. You sing along with yourself or you read along with yourself Mm -hmm. and therefore you're matching the inflections, you're matching the pace, and that thing punches in and you shouldn't hear it. Mm -hmm. It should just keep on going. That's right. That's the way it should be. Well, I mean... This does bring up something. Yeah, no, no, please go ahead. Well, something I saw at NAB, um, which I think I saw it after the NAB discussion we did, but I can't remember the name of the company. It was in one of the, um, like the startup parks, you know, how they have Uh startup parks? Yeah, where they have a bunch of little kiosks in an area where, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I've been wanting to do. And so kind of funny because this is an example where Google has gotten too good at it. For example... They're using Google's voice to text features Mm -hmm. and they basically have an editor, an audio editor where you edit text. Oh yeah. It's awesome. Well, Adobe is. Think about how that changes. Well, Adobe did that a year or two ago. Yes, Adobe did, but it didn't quite seem as, this one seemed pretty thorough because it was like the display had the waveform and above the waveform were the individual words as well as what just looked like a traditional text edit. And they were able, you could not do intra word editing, but you could Chop it up any other way you want. Ah, that's to. the difference. And with the audition system, um, you can literally change the text as though you're editing a word document, and it rearranges the waveform to create the word you didn't say. In okay, your so voice. this one, theirs goes intra word. Gotcha. This this one is just editing the sentences. The problems that they've run into, for example, is that Google removes ums and uhs. Oh. <laughs> So right oh, now dear. it's a really cool experiment. It's a cool hack, yeah. but if anything that re- re- relies on open source, free Google, anything is, I hate to say it, destined, destined for failure because Google changes crap Chrome. at a whim and removes stuff all the time. <laughs> Google giveth and yep. they taketh away all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so death yeah. by the sword, live by the sword, die <laughs> live the sword. by the sword, die yeah. by the sword. That is exactly. Google in a nutshell, but that's pretty brilliant. I wish I saw that area. I'm ticked that I didn't see that at NAB, but um, to wrap up the, the, the editing thing, the record and edit. Um, yeah. Another, there's another program that's nowhere near as well known as the others called OSEN audio, O C E N A U D I O. And um, it looks like ocean without the A. I think these are folks from South America, but don't quote me on that. They're not from the U S. And I think there's students developing this software. It's so it's totally free. It's open. I don't know if it's open source, but it's free. But they've baked in a punch and roll function. And it's very rudimentary, fully destructive, but it works. And it has three seconds or what you can put in the pre-roll you want. And it just works. So I, a lot of voice actors who are doing a hybrid where they record in ocean audio and then they edit in Twisted Wave, for example. Um, and then I know another fellow who hacked Adobe Audition with a script to give it a actual punch and roll function. So there, there's so much of a need for punch and roll editing that people are hacking systems that don't have it to Audition add. Audition doesn't have Audition it? Audition does not have proper I, punch and roll. You can't do I, it. It's so bizarre. I mean, even GarageBand has it. No, I, I know. I've even shown people how to do it in GarageBand. Um, but yeah, it, it um, it's crazy. And then uh, don't even talk about Audacity because it has its own. It doesn't do that either. <sighs> And then I know people that have kind of figured out ways around that in Audacity too. But for true native proper punch and roll, Reaper, I think is my favorite. Pro Tools is obviously a very good choice. Um, you know, and I know people that use Studio One. I still don't really understand Studio One that well, but it works. So that's, mm-hmm. that's the way you get a finished file, arguably the fastest. The clicker method, some people still like it because they don't like having to switch out of actor brain into editor brain when they're recording. Some people don't even want to have a screen in the room. They just want to have the mic, a lamp, and a book. And they just don't, yeah. you know. I, I can understand the not wanting to switch. Yeah. That does make sense from, you know, like like you either have to not want to switch out of your mode of acting or you want to not have to revisit that moment where you knew exactly what you needed to do. Right. You just get it over with. Exactly. Um, one other thing that comes into play here is it's not available anymore, but the Sonic Solution system. So back in the day, Sonic Studio. I used it in I, college. I, think, I used it at Virginia Tech. We used it for editing and mastering the and authoring the, the CD. Right. Well, CD mastering, right. That's how I got familiar with it. And you could load your dat tape in. And once you got the first song loaded in, you could, and it's loading in the second song, you could start editing the first right. song. You could start editing that file before it was even finished. So you can imagine if you had a two-man team, one person reading 
then the editor could start editing things while you continue reading. Whoa, that's pretty intense. You guys, sure. give me one second. I know. I, 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 I can hear. It, Sage, it's your daughter. Sage, turn the radio off. <laughs> <laughs> no, bro. Uh, right. Light home life. That's getting edited out. <laughs> yeah. No, that's all right. We'll leave it in. Um, there was uh, one. Uh, <laughs> why not? Um, normally, I, I use a different setup to this, but I, I thought because we're talking about audio books and a lot of people and, and Helen's about to talk about her, you know, setting up a home studio and stuff that I would use something a bit different. And I know that, uh, George, you're very au fait with uh, Grace products, Grace Design. Good buddies. So I'm using, and this is a really good way of getting some nice gear without breaking the budget. Uh, I'm using the M101 preamp and uh, the Rode NT1. Mm-hmm. And uh, to me, it sounds really good. What do you think? That's what you're using today. That's, it sounds that's, that's, yeah. that's what you're right now. clean. Yeah. And that's fabulous. The mic sounds not yeah. the way I expected it. I thought I sometimes thought of that mic as being maybe on the brighter side. It sounds with your voice very, very pleasing. Yeah. I, yeah. I really, I think it works really well. And, you know, I mean, what sort of money are you talking? Maybe, I don't know what it is in US dollars, but... Uh, I think the mics are about 270 Australian dollars and the preamp here is probably more expensive than there. I think it's about 1200 Australian dollars for the M101. Yeah, I think it's under 800 stateside. Yeah. In fact, I think I've seen them M101s for about 600 and something. Mm-hmm. Could be wrong, US dollars. Mm-hmm. And I think the NT1's probably 200 bucks, maybe right. 230. And then what's your AD conversion? How are you getting into the computer? Uh, yeah, well, that's the trick, isn't it? It's going through uh, an RME into the uh, computer. Oh, yeah. No, everybody's, everybody's got one of those kicking around. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> that's a really good AD computer. Yeah, the M101 is about 700 bucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, the RME, uh, anything RME is great. You know, I mean, their products are very rock solid. They're known for really reliable drivers and just just reliable, you know, really good. Yeah. A little bit confusing, but... Like I, I find their the console? their software is very similar to the UA. It console is in a way, can do a lot of similar mm-hmm. things. But I don't know, not not quite as clear as I think. There's lots of little things, and you click on it, and then the channel opens up to the side, and then you see these controls that you were looking for because there's a little tiny little button. <laughs> yes, yes, that's so right. Made it well, I've got a, open. mine's a PCI card, so it's uh, not a not a rack mount uh, RME. So it's actually in the computer, and I have to open up the um, the mixer from called Hammerfall, right. right? But it took me about a year to find, to find the, the little black dot in the bottom of the screen, and I, I just the cursor went across it, and something popped up. It's like, what the hell is that? <laughs> yeah. and, and then clicked on it, and up came the mixer. It's like, oh, that's good. Could be handy. Sometimes I think. engineers are a little too slick for their own good. I mean, that's, yeah. I've dealt with a lot of software, and you know, sometimes Apple is definitely one of those companies who goes for slick and then thinks it's intuitive, but in the end it's not. It's just another learning curve to learn a new way of doing things sometimes. And that is what these engineers yep. sometimes forget. You know, sometimes slick is not the best way. Even though it looks cleaner on the screen, it might be harder to figure out how to operate it. So but yeah. it sounds fantastic, that's for sure. Well it's the curse of working on your own. And speaking of which, let's find out what Helen does working on her own. Now we have Helen Lloyd on the line from the UK, where it's still rather frosty. How are you, Helen? I'm very well, thanks. Slightly chilly, but uh, I gather you're sweltering at your end of the world. Yeah, yeah. Well, Robbo is and I'm not, because um, I'm slightly south of him and it's a bit chilly down here. Is but, it? Uh, you mean well, about 30 degrees? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's 25 not degrees. Quite. He's swell. He's having a hard yeah, time. Yeah. It's, it's about 20, uh, 22, <laughs> I think. It's a bit chilly. Oh, but, uh, oh terrible. <laughs> yeah, it's awful. It's terrible. Yes, it's awful. Can't bear it. Have to move somewhere warmer. Now, I was going to start off by asking you the question, which I've never, because we've known each other for a while, but I've never asked you this. What is your background? I trained at what happened well. I went to the theatre at the age of four and came out saying, that's what I'm going to do when I grow up, um, and never really changed my mind. So I went to uh, Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London. Uh, where I trained, you know, full two years, full two, um, full-time course as an actor, doing all sorts of things, mime, um, physical theatre, 
radio, drama, Shakespeare, the whole caboose, you know, the whole lot. Um, Very intensive course, very excellent course with some wonderful tutors. And I then left and joined the Nottingham Playhouse Company, which was one of the, and still is, one of the foremost theatre companies in the world, um, in the UK, certainly. And uh, I was there for almost two years as an acting ASM, so 14th lady-in-waiting from the left, and tea maker, generally, um, for a couple of years, learning all sorts of wonderful things, touring to the National Theatre with Jonathan Miller and his production of King Lear with Michael Horton, all sorts of wonderful stuff. Um, and then I spent the next 14 years treading the boards, essentially, um, round the British theatre system, from Pitt Lockery in Scotland down to Plymouth in the southwest and I played all sorts of roles everything from the Wicked Witch of the West um, to Miss Julie and everything in between and then I found myself in the mousetrap oh which was quite extraordinary so I was in year 29 of the mousetrap it's now in year 65 I think wow wow so it's still running um so I am part of history (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's the it's the only it's the only play you could actually join as a child and die. <laughs> because yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I am thinking that I am actually now old enough to return and play the redoubtable Mrs. Boyle. But um, <laughs> I don't know whether that's going to happen. There was a funny story about that actually. There was an American gentleman that we met. I met in the pub afterwards, who who was very effusive about how wonderful it all was. This load of old tap that I was in, and um, he came to me in the pub afterwards and said, "Hey, that was absolutely great. Have you been in it since the beginning?" And I thought, "My God, I know I've aged in this year, but surely not by <laughs> twenty nine years." Yeah, uh, but it was wonderful. It, it was a great experience, and uh, I mean, the, the funny stories like the guy who was hired to with a brown felt tip pen to paint out the bald patches and the carpet, which he did every night before the curtain went up. <laughs> um, because <laughs> that was how they made their money. They they were so tight that, uh, you know, everything was paired to the bone. But actually, the best thing about the mousetrap is that every 10 years or so, you get invited to the Savoy for lunch. Oh, really? Oh, so, nice. so I've now had, I think, five lunches at the Savoy, nice. which is very nice, lovely. And while I was in the mousetrap, I saw an advertisement in the stage uh, about a new television company that was opening up in the Midlands who was looking for presenters. And now by this time I'd met my husband, who is also an actor, so we'd spent the first sort of couple of years of our relationship often hundreds of miles apart, and we'd settled in Nottingham because that was in the middle of the country. So if one of us was working in Southampton and the other was in Perth, we could actually possibly meet on a Sunday afternoon for a couple of hours because it was in the middle making none of the journeys too long. So the idea of working in a television company in my hometown for a short while was very appealing. So I thought, oh, I won't get it, but I'll apply for it. And lo and behold, I did get it. So I spent the next seven years as an InVision and voice continuity announcer and presenter for ITV. Wow. So that was a complete departure from what I'd done before. And that was really when I started getting into voiceover work because obviously there were local radio stations. We did all the commercials in house. Um, I got to narrate a couple of documentaries and started getting bookings as a freelance voice actor um, for other things at that point. And then my career took another swift change because somebody well I was getting too old by then I was in my mid 30s and they kept muttering things about you know she's going grey she's looking a bit (laughs) rattled on camera Uh, and all this stuff so um, I took a literally so I took a sideways swoop when somebody went on maternity leave and moved into production and I started out as a sort of researcher and producer of um I suppose you'd call them social action programs. And at this point, I got a Winston Churchill Travelling Fellowship to Australia to study social action. Yeah, I did uh, three months in Australia looking at social action broadcasting. And I travelled from the northern, right up in the Northern Territories. I did um, Alice Springs and further north, going up to Catherine and onto the Aboriginal stations up there. 
Yep. Um, I did um, Adelaide, I did Melbourne, I did Sydney, and I did Brisbane, and I did Canberra. So I spent three months in Australia with a four, three-year-old, <laughs> because I oh. tried to take him with me, essentially. Um, and it was fantastic. It was a wonderful experience. Came back, wrote a thesis on why ITV should spend more money on social action broadcasting and how important it was that people had access to broadcast media. And they promptly cut the budget and cl completely closed down the social action oh, um, budget. <laughs> oh, now, because which, of what, that, what? I was working for ITV Central. And this was in the late 80s, just before the television franchises came up for grabs again. And Central, at that point, ceased to exist. And Carlton Television bought it. Now, Carlton was a much bigger and much less regionally interested organisation. I mean, I was basically doing what you call public service announcements. And Central had an enormous commitment to those. I mean, we made... Well, we made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them following the Australian model because a presenter called Kevin Morrison had travelled to Australia in the early 80s and had set up the whole um, public service announcement scheme in the UK uh, with vol the voluntary sector and uh, various television companies. And <clears throat> it was an extraordinary thing to be involved in because it meant that... We weren't only making 30-second um, commercials, as it were. Central produced a daily five-minute social action programme at that point, which wow. I produced. That was how I started producing. So we would go to the major charities. We would go to smaller charities. People would do an appeal. We'd go out and film, um, I don't know, um, a holiday group of disabled people at a theme park, for example, because one of the organisations that was local to us offered holidays to people with disabilities. And we, we followed a family through the process. We did, we, I did hundreds of these. It was extraordinary. And it got me into producing. And then when that stopped in the early 90s, when Carlton took over and decided that they were going to be much more, um, much less regional, in other words, the television company that had been the Midlands and split into East Midlands and West Midlands was now owned by a company that also owned parts of Wales, all of London, and the Midlands, both East and West, down as far as Gloucestershire and up as far as Stoke-on-Trent. So the whole regional thing kind of had to disappear because we were no longer a regional station as such. We were much bigger. And at that point, I then moved and became a staff producer and was making documentary series um, about narrowboats and about health and beauty and about uh, archive series like, you know, 50 years of caravanning, yes. <laughs> all sorts of bizarre things. And uh, I, I did that until 2003 when I took redundancy. Wow. So... My career kind of turned completely about face. I then went back into the theatre briefly, um, did some acting again, which was terrifying after 20-odd years because I had got out of the habit of learning lines and thought, hmm, I think I might be better at reading things than trying to remember them. Yeah. So I built a studio at home and essentially at that point got back into doing voiceovers. I was then called back into ITV a couple of times to narrate documentaries. I mean, in all over the years, I narrated about 50 broadcast documentaries for ITV and did bits and bobs. I've, I've always, I always managed to run two careers concurrently. So even though I was producing stuff, I was also voicing stuff for other people. So once my tonsils were in gear, as it were, they kind of kept going under their own of their own accord, alongside everything else for a long time. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, it seemed a natural progression to try and get back into it again when I was made redundant. So by then, the home studio revolution had begun, far less in the UK than it is in the, in the US, I think. Um, but I decided that that was the route to go down, so I set myself up with a, at the, at the time, very, very basic home studio and started making contacts again. Uh, and gradually over the years I've improved it and it's now, well, it's now what I do virtually full time. Yeah. Uh, it's mainly audio books, but other long form stuff and the odd corporate and video game and, well, the whole gamut really. So when you when you uh, started building your home studio, um, 
who did you turn to to give you a, you know give you some advice about how to do it? I, I mean, there was just so much information out there at that point. And I started out with Audacity in a USB microphone and essentially a large cardboard box that sat around my head. <laughs> it sounds bad. <laughs> but I bought the biggest... Uh, ben built me a, a giant cardboard box that I lined with acoustic foam with a hole in the floor for, the, for my head so my head would sit in this box... <laughs> <laughs> looking like some kind of bizarre Dalek. Um, and uh, my microphone, and I had a little light in the roof of it. And um, <laughs> it was very basic, but it was OK. I mean, the sound quality wasn't dreadful. And then I contacted um, Dan Leonard, and I did a couple of sessions with him about setting up uh, properly. And I upgraded my microphone, and I... I uh, commissioned a little room we I'm very lucky we live in a house which has a, a basement yeah, yeah so perfect. I was able to commission a basement well it's a semi-basement room it's only basement on three sides but uh, the other side opens into a garage but I commissioned that little room and lined it out properly with acoustic foam and bought a decent microphone and uh, learned about I've always been because I was editing when I was a producer at ITV, I knew what good sound should sound like. Yeah. Uh, because, obviously, I was working with sound engineers and recording engineers. And when I was editing a documentary, I always did at least one edit with my eyes closed so that I was listening rather than watching because I always found the pictures slightly distracting. And I found that if I just close my eyes and listen, I would know whether the audio was working to tell the story. So I knew I knew all the editing stuff because I'd been editing in, um, well, um, not in uh, audio editing, but picture editing with audio. So I knew how editing worked and I knew what good audio should sound like and I knew that I wasn't sounding like it. So it was really a question of tweaking everything and learning more and finding out about acoustics and sound waves and bass traps and you know what what happened to sound waves and how they traveled around a space and how changing the space could change the audio um and i've now got a studio that it's not perfect by any means because it's not totally isolated there is occasional bleed through from you know heavy trucks passing or airplanes or whatever um but it's certainly workable Mm. That uh, that little tip of uh, doing one pass with your eyes closed when you're editing, there's a, a, I could name a million editors who should listen to that tip because I tell you what, some of the some of the stuff that I get sent that I'm expected to rescue uh, is unbelievable. Mm. Unbelievable. Well, there's a funny thing, mm. funny you should say that because a mate of mine who's an English guy lives here, a guy called Chris Dickey, who we actually interviewed on really early in the piece on this podcast or the earlier podcast, now he lives here, he teaches audio. And one of the things he does to the students is gets them off Pro Tools and makes them work on tape and gets them to oh, wow. drop edit on yeah, tape. Right. And yeah. he said it f yeah. absolutely <laughs> freaks them out. They're looking for yeah. something. There's no there's undo. nothing to look at. Yeah. Yeah. There's no yeah. undo, sunshine. Yeah. Get it right the first yeah. time. Yeah. Well, well, that's when I started editing. That was how I was editing. I mean, we weren't, we weren't actually using tape, I don't think, but... Yes, we were using tape. Yeah, you but were. You, you would have had, had to, to have edit. Been. Yeah. yeah, and you had to edit sequentially. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't drop something in and then go back. You had no, to have right. your, you had to have a proper shot list because you had to start at the beginning of a piece and move mm. to the end. Mm. And if you changed anything at the beginning, you know, you just couldn't do it. Um, but I've always enjoyed sound. I've always been a radio listener. Um, I much prefer radio to television. And of course, I grew up in the day of great radio. You know. Round the Horn, Beyond Our Ken, all those wonderful and big, big dramas. Saturday Night Theatre, all the major drama productions of my youth, unless I was going to the theatre, were all on the radio. We didn't actually have... I didn't have a television until I went to college at 20. Is that by choice, though? Because there was television. Yeah, by choice. By choice. Yeah. Because radio was better to me, and yeah. actually still is. Drama of the mind, they used to call it. Drama of the mind. Yes. Yeah, it is. So what do you think, based on that, what is the most important thing, do you think, in any delivery of a voiceover? I think the ability to act. 
Because if you don't believe and if you're not engaged in what you're saying, whether it be a toilet brush or a, you know, an appeal for a charity or, or an audio book or anything, actually, if you don't sound engaged and if you don't believe in what you're saying, then how on earth can you hope to convince the audience? You have to know who you're speaking to. You have to know why you're speaking to them. And you have to become the voice of whoever wrote that text or whoever is selling that product, whatever that product happens to be. And that calls for putting yourself aside as you and putting yourself as that person you're playing a character into the role that you're playing. So I think that's the most important thing. It's interesting, is it, because a lot of people put, uh, especially males, uh, put a lot of emphasis on the quality of their voice as opposed to, you know, what they do with it. Yes, but I think, I think the danger with that is that if you have a good voice, and most voice people do have a good voice, you then, st if you start thinking, oh, I'm sounding so wonderful on this, oh, this voice is just, oh, I'm going to woo them with my voice. Yes, but that voice is actually completely disconnected from the text that you're speaking. It yeah. becomes the voice. And what people then, the listener then ends up doing is listening and saying, gosh, this is a beautiful voice. But are they hearing the message that that voice is putting over? And if they're not, then that commercial or narrative or documentary or whatever has failed. How do you see the difference between um, the UK and the US in that respect? Do you think their delivery is different? I think... Yes, I think it's hugely different, hugely different. Um, I think a lot of that is to do with the, the vocal tone and the way that people speak in America. You know, the inflections are different. I think British people tend to, they use inflection in a more, dis, almost in a more descriptive way. Um, there's more, in a way it's more subtle because there is more onomatopoeia. There's more use of things like onomatopoeia. There's more use of, of adding ambience and texture to words by the way the voice speaks them. There certainly is for me. And I think that because an awful lot of voice people in the UK have an acting background rather than a radio background or a technical background. I mean, certainly in audiobooks, the vast majority of British audiobook readers come from an acting background. And that isn't necessarily so in the States. I think there are far more people who've come from a radio background or a television background or just a different background altogether. You know, nothing to do with audio um, because there's so much more work over there that it seems to me that there's... Um, not a limitless supply, but, you know, there is, there's also that feeling, I think, the whole attitude to work in America is very different. There's a kind of, you know, if you, if you, what is that line from the film? If you, if you bring it, they will come. Uh, and it's a kind of twist on that. You know, if you want something enough, and if you take enough courses, and if you do enough training, and if you believe in it enough, you will be able to do it. And I think that's cultural thing in the States that I don't think exists in quite the same way in the UK. And I think that changes the way that things happen over there. Um, yeah. And over here, things are done much more traditionally, certainly in audiobooks. The vast majority of audiobooks are still cast by via agents and recorded in professional studios. There are only two UK publishers that I can think of that will accept remote recording for audiobooks. Wow. And for all the others, you have to go into a studio to do it. Now, that's partly geographical because, you know, it, flying somebody from, I don't know, from Alaska to New York is going to add goodness knows what to your budget for an audiobook. But sticking somebody on a train from Derby to London and they don't pay expenses anyway, um, it's not going to make any difference over here. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it, it is hugely different. I'm very lucky in that one of the production companies that I work for, having assessed my audio um, and the quality of my audio, is happy for me to work remotely with them, which is great. But an awful lot of the audio books that I record are not for British publishers or British producers, they're for American ones. Two things. One, onomatopoeia could be the new buzzword, just saying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Good. The other thing. Now is, spell it. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, come on. This is not mastermind. Um, in fact, far from it. Um, 
I'm just going to say the, the other thing about the Americans, they're, they're very happy to blow their own trumpet um, yes. and being a bit more... We're um, much more reticent. So how do you find that when you're trying to market yourself? I've, I used to find it incredibly difficult. Uh, phenomenally difficult. In fact, I didn't do any marketing at all. I kind of, it sounds terribly arrogant, but I sort of worked on the attitude, well, I'm here, I know I can do it, come and find me, which yeah, is yeah, ridiculous. Yeah. And, you know, I think I think that's something that is, it's just not a feasible way of working. And initially I was quite tentative about it. And because I've been around for such a long time, I do have quite a lot of contacts. So a lot of the work that I was doing was repeat work from regular clients people were coming back and 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 you know saying can you do this but then I suddenly realized that there was a whole other world out there that I that was completely untapped you know there was the world of Twitter and the world of Facebook uh, and I was on Facebook but I was on, on only on Facebook as as me personally you know and I had I used it to con keep in touch with relatives in Australia and America and New Zealand and people on holiday and family in Wales and things. But I, I, I never considered using it for business purposes at all. Yeah. And uh, Twitter was something that I didn't do Twitter. And then I, the penny kind of slowly dropped. I think when I started, really when I started doing audiobooks seriously, because it became obvious that Certainly, if you were doing books on ACX, which I don't think is available in Australia at the moment, uh, that's the Audiobook Creation Exchange, yeah. which is run by Audible and is a way of, of authors and narrators directly connecting in order to produce audiobooks. It has advantages. It doesn't work terribly well in the UK, works brilliantly in the US, um, but it's in its infancy in the UK, so it's early days. Uh but once you ever do anything on that, and I did three books very early on when I got back into uh, audio with a, an American producer, because I knew that I needed to get some kind of, I mean, the audio, I had done audio books before, but it was in 1982, for goodness sake. <laughs> and they weren't, you know, they no longer existed, thankfully, because I'm sure they were dreadful. Um, but... You know, I knew I had to get a portfolio of some kind together. So I joined forces with an American producer and did a couple of books on ACX and realized that if I didn't help to sell those books by marketing them and myself, I wouldn't earn any money. So I that was really when I started marketing myself. And I have got a lot braver. Um, I mean, I tweet all the time. I'm kind of almost addicted to Twitter, I'm afraid. And it's a wonderful way of finding out what other people are doing, what friends and colleagues are doing, what's going on. I've actually had work directly from Twitter. Um, I've had work directly from LinkedIn. And I've had lots of inquiries from Facebook. I haven't actually ever booked a job from Facebook. But I suspect people have been directed to my website and have come to me a different way. Yeah, social media is something that you just have to bite the bullet and do. And I think I, I blog regularly. I write an article. I mean, I, I blog. Um, and I do, I do have a kind of serious audio blog, which is not your kind of, oh, look what I'm doing. It's things like, what is onomatopoeia? Let's have a look at onomatopoeia <laughs> and how to use it in audiobooks. So it's quite serious. It's quite studious. Um, it, it's a good way of marketing yourself, marketing me as what I am, which is a kind of somebody who takes it quite seriously. And I think with I think with the kind of work that I do, you have to take it seriously. I hate the idea that it's it's the one thing I really bugs me about the way the industry is going at the moment is this constant proliferation of poor quality audio and poor quality um, artistic skills because there's this there's this feeling that all you need is a all you need is a microphone and the ability to read and you too can be a voiceover it drives me up the wall and there are so many pay to play sites that are uh, uh, you know are continually pushing there are hundreds of coaches saying you know i can make you an absolute beginner into a star overnight i don't think it works like that and that does irritate me dreadfully and i think it irritates an awful lot of other professional voice actors it's interesting though that a lot of people that are, would be pushing back against that the snake oil salesman become snake oil salesmen themselves because i think there's a it's it's 
I, I think people panic about being left behind. And I think you have to have faith in what you do well, and you have to play to your strengths. There are some voice actors who are exceptionally good coaches, really good coaches, and, and spend their time equally, half and half probably, between doing their voice work and coaching. And they have a lot to share with people that is of great value. But if you're not doing that, if you are only a voice actor, and only a voice actor, I say, and everybody around you is offering coaching, I think there's a horrible temptation to think, well, I've been doing it for two years. Uh, perhaps I ought to start coaching as well. Because you feel left out, because everybody else is sticking on their website. I'm coaching, and you can charge. I mean, I, you know, I suppose $150 an hour is the average. And if you're coaching, and that's for audiobook coaching, but I know people in America who are charging $250 an hour to coach voice work. Well, $250 an hour, if you're doing three people a, a day, is a lot more money than you're going to earn doing e-learning, for example, or audiobooks. So it's quite tempting to do that. It's a temptation I've managed to avoid so far. So far, yes. No, it's ah. not something, to be honest, it's not something I... I mean, I, I what I would like to do, and I, I, I do enjoy doing, is actually directing people far more than... Now, whether you call that coaching or not, I suppose in a way it is. But if an actor, a voice actor wants, particularly for audiobooks, if somebody's doing an audition, for example, or setting up a voice reel or doing uh, a building a website, I'm very happy to, for people to send me a read and I will then direct them or direct them live as they would be directed in a studio with a director on the other side of the glass. I don't think that is the same thing as coaching, but... That is something I would do and occasionally do do. But I would certainly never set myself up as a coach, I don't think. And until I, unless I got to the point where my tonsils packed up. Um, in which case I might, because I can't imagine not a time when I wouldn't be doing something. Yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? And you kind of, because uh, this is always the concern and the million dollar question is, what is going to happen in the next five or ten years? Are we going to be relevant? Um, well, yeah. What, do you, what yeah. do you think? I think AI might well take over in technical work you know I mean if you're if you're describing how to put a flat pack piece of furniture together why do you need an actor to do that it is purely fact um, and it's not actually terribly engaging fact so I could see the I could see AI taking over on that side kind of voice work um, I could see AI taking over in terms of possibly some educational stuff, although I think it would be a shame. But I don't think it will ever... Well, at the moment, I don't think the ability is there for it to have the emotional connection for drama, for long-form narration, for um, narration for documentaries, for audiobooks. I just don't think the capability of it is there. It might be, but I think I'll be long gone by then, so it won't bother me. Well, you never know. But uh, I'm, I'm just curious yeah. to see what's going to happen. I, I mean, you know, the, the changes that have happened um, since we've been doing it, I mean, yeah. that's been pretty dramatic, I, you know, yeah. over the last 30 or 40 years. I do think as, as the quality of things falls, which it is doing, I think, the expectations of the quality begins to fall. And I think people who want quality actually rebel against that in a very strong way. I think that's shown hugely in television. I mean, television went through a... Pay it was a very good in the in the early 80s with series like Morse and um, things like that that were, you know, really high-quality stuff. And then it got terribly cheap and cheerful and people stopped watching. And now the quality is beginning to creep back because there's an understanding, I think, that poor quality, poor with low production values, it might be cheaper to produce, it might be wallpaper, but at the end of the day, there are always going to be people who want quality. And if you provide them with quality, like the, the latest BBC Blue Planet, for example, it was worth every single penny of the licence fee for that series, in my opinion, because it will go on forever and ever and ever. It will be sold all over the world. There'll be books, there'll be repeats. It will go on and on and on and will maintain 
will show what quality television can achieve that cheap television just can't. And I think when we're bombarded with images and with sound and with, you know, so much noise going on, there will always be seekers for quality. There will always be people who want to go to a symphony orchestra and listen to that rather than to listen to a digitised version. And I kind of hang on to that and think if you can provide the quality, you might not do as much, but what you do will be always good and there will always be people who will be prepared to pay for that. That's my opinion. I hope I'm right. Well, I think you I'm are. Sure you are. It's- but if you want, I mean, if you want to know how stupid television's getting, and I, and you know, I believe that television is, in, especially here in Australia, is in a huge demise. One of the most popular shows on television here is a show, a television show about people watching television. One of the highest. Uh, ra- yes. Gogglebox. It's one of the highest rating shows Gogglebox, of the year. Gogglebox. It's yes. It's, oh yes, it's on here too. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it, I can't even watch it. It's. I know. I know. Well, you kind of wonder. Well, and I mean, the whole. Sorry. No, no. I was just going to say the whole kind of co- competition. You know, from the voice to um, the X Factor, all of that kind of genre, um, and the I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, and all of that sort of thing. I mean, that I suppose that's catering to one area of the audience, but. People, I think people grow out of that, to be honest. Mm. And there is always going to be a constant supply of that kind of material. You know, there's room for that as well. But don't just have that at the expense of the quality. Because if you do, it, it, I just think it kind of shrivels up and dies. There's no, uh, there's nothing in it that will sustain you when you're feeling, I want something a little more. I think the wild card here is Netflix, though, because some of their programming that they're throwing out at the moment is yeah. incredible. Yeah, I agree. I think there's a hu- I think there's a the problem with it is is that we pay a television license to the BBC, and there's an awful lot of people who feel that that once they've paid that, that's it. Mm. They're not going to pay anymore. Mm. You know, and 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 in a way. I kind of agree with them. Um, I just hope that the BBC doesn't stop having a licence. I mean, I sound like my mother now. God, this is awful. <laughs> <laughs> what have you led me into? <laughs> a rabbit uh, but, hole. You know, yes, quite, you have. You've deliberately led me into a rabbit hole, I'm afraid. But no, I, I, do, think, I do think it's ridiculous. We, you can't possibly watch 700 channels. You just can't. Um, Life is too short, um, and I would rather watch one channel that does good stuff than 40 channels that does rubbish. But then I'm an old-fashioned girl. Well, back in the 80s, Bruce Springsteen wrote the song with the lyric, <laughs> 57 say. channels and nothing on. I couldn't remember how many channels it yeah, was. Well, that's right. Yeah. Well, it's 157 now, and there's still nothing on. <laughs> there's still nothing yes. on, except yeah, the exactly. pizza of law and order. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Oh, don't, exactly. don't. <laughs> You yeah. know, the funny thing is, I didn't realise this, but you were probably working at Central Television in the mid-80s, would that be right? Yes, I was there from 1980 until 2003. Wow. Because I went into Central, in Birmingham. Yeah, I was in Birmingham and in Nottingham. Yep, well, I was in uh, Birmingham Central TV for a TV show called Pop Around. Does that ring My a bell? My God. Yes, it does. <laughs> well, you really? How yes. extraordinary. Yep, pop around. And uh, it was in excess were there for their first English tour and I, it was just playing, playing pubs and they hadn't really broken in, in the UK at all, but they ended up getting a guest spot on pop around. So we My went into the we pop wow. around and walking down the corridor into the, we were sitting in the green room waiting to go on. This guy was walking down the corridor towards us and I was looking thinking, I know that person. And it was Jimmy Greaves. Yes, of course. Well, he was, he was, he was there all the time. Yeah. I mean, he was part of. Yeah, but that building's gone. It's all completely demolished. Oh wow! They built a brand new studio complex in about ninety ninety five, ninety six, I suppose. And that studio, all those huge studios, became absolutely defunct. They were just empty and they were hired out a couple of times for independent productions and films uh, but then no the whole lot's gone now all gone yeah. and there were skips outside of, of tape all the all the archive they just chucked the whole lot there were skips oh, outside no. of videos oh, and, wow. no. and rolls and rolls and oh, rolls of film wow. yeah it was horrendous yeah. it was well that's I actually yeah. grabbed I got a copy of the two inch copy of the um, their appearance Wow, and, uh, which which is still here in Australia. I I found it in the archives at Channel Seven here in in Melbourne. 
Good uh, gracious. A friend of mine called me and said, I found these tapes. It was about eight and a half hours of tape, and that was part of it. It was a two-inch reel. Good so, gracious me. Oh, oh well rescued. Want to get Indeed. your hands on God. that? Well, that's, yeah. well, I could have introduced you. I could have been sitting there in my little box and saying, and now, boys and girls, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, our next programme is Pop Around. Hearing you say that, though, isn't it crazy the things we do for a living? <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. there you go, a path crossed. A path crossed, indeed. We could have walked past each other in a corridor. Probably did, along with Jimmy Greaves. <laughs> along with Jimmy Greaves, yeah. <laughs> for those something. who don't know who Jimmy Greaves is, because the guys, the NXS guys had no idea. He came in, introduced himself and left, and they went, who was that guy? <laughs> Jimmy Greaves. I go, who's Jimmy Greaves? And Jimmy Greaves, mate. Played who's the World Jimmy Greaves? Cup. Good gray. Bunch of boys from French's Forest, New South Wales. They wouldn't know That's what right. was going around on. around the corner from you, Robbo. I grew up in the same suburb, went to the same school. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> now, come on, yeah. boys, this is getting silly. It is getting <laughs> yeah, silly. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And by the way, Ben, who you refer to, people probably still see on TV, because I'm sure the bill is still running. It is. Oh, somewhere, I think, Yeah, surely. I think it is. Yeah. I think, yeah, he was he was in it for 14 years, so it was, it was a long haul. Yeah. He was in it for a long time. Who did he play? Chief Inspector Conway. Okay. I didn't watch a lot of it. My my old man was religious grumpy. with it. Grumpy. Al- always grumpy. But the opening sequence had him pushing open a pair of doors and striding through them in the latter days. I mean, he ah. started off as a, a young, slim thing with red hair and he ended up with a <laughs> slightly more rounded person with slightly thinner reddish Happen, hair. Happens to the best of us. It happens, happens to life, the best isn't it? Of us. Yeah, it is. It is life. Yeah. He still gets recognised, which is weird because he's now got a full beard in in an attempt to disguise. <laughs> uh, but he still does get spotted. I was going to say, does he get that classic TV personality, people coming up to him in the street and, you know, why aren't you in uniform and how dare you arrest such and no, such or no, whatever? No, not, not so much, although in its in its heyday, there was a, we went to a wedding. We went to a friend's wedding and we were all sitting, slightly the worse for wear. It was a beautiful hot summer's day and we were sitting late at night in a, a, outside a pub, tables outside a pub, and Ben was, there were a whole group of us there. And this police car came zooming past going, Nina, 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 screeched to a halt, did a U-turn, came back, drove into the cub, pub car park. The police, two policemen got out of the car, walked up to Ben, saluted and said, <laughs> uh, sorry, sir, we're just on the chase of an IC1. There's an IC1 male running down the blah, 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 and blah, 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 and there's been a thing. And uh, we're sorry, sir, we're, we're not really, etc. And Ben said, this is quite all right. Off, off you go, go and do your duty. And they obviously thought, they, they did a, you know, they clocked him and thought, oh, God, he's a policeman. He's a senior policeman. We need to go and explain why we're speeding down these country roads. And it was the full kind of, you know, touching their peaked caps and all the rest of it. And Ben just played along. And they must have felt such idiots when they realised what was going on. It was very, very funny. One of the highlights of his uh, of his career. He could have been done for impersonating a police officer, I suspect, but it was very, very funny. I love it. Yes, that's that's right. awesome. It, yes, indeed. Now, your siren, that was an onomatopoeia. Anima, <laughs> Nina, Nina, indeed. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you could hear it, couldn't you? You could imagine it happening. Oh, I could imagine that, yeah. I was there. I, I was completely in the moment. <laughs> and on, on that crazy note... Next time I need some sound here. design effects, I'm going to give you a call, fella. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Oh, oh, that's good to know that I will have an ongoing career when can my you, tonsils are packed up. Can Being you whoosh and bang for movie trailers? Like, <laughs> oh, I can boom. whoosh and bang, Absolutely. Gunshot, here comes, yeah. here comes Mrs Foley. <laughs> That's something I would have loved to have done. I'd love to have been a Foley artist. Uh, yeah. I yeah. think it's a fascinating job. Is that, <laughs> there's a, uh, right, what a silly conversation. All right, well, thanks, Helen. That was great. It's lovely to talk to you. Yeah, you That's too. That's a pleasure. I hope things warm up. Good, very nice to talk to you. I hope I didn't waffle too much. No, it's, no, it's good to save me talking. You're going to edit. You're going oh, to edit, edit with aren't my, you? I'm going to edit with my eyes shut now. <laughs> oh, good. I can so do that because I, I grew up in tape days, so I, I don't need to see it. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. No, you don't. <laughs> well, there you go. That was Helen talking about her career and an interesting career indeed. Mm-hmm. Man, she's got a lot of wisdom to share. Yeah. Really, uh, I was really impressed with her and her background and her varied background, which led her to where she is now. It was just quite cool to hear. 
Yeah. I, what I found interesting was the fact that she was editing pictures and that was the way she learned how to edit audio. That was a big thing she said. I know, you know, I don't know the technology, but I do know at least what sounds good. And that's a huge head start if you're setting up a studio, knowing what you should actually sound like. Yeah. I, she actually did a job. A guy contacted me here in Melbourne. They were doing, um, it wasn't World Vision, but it was something like that. And it was a very emotive piece of, of film. And uh, the guy contacted me and said, do you know anyone? And I introduced him to Helen. And I tell you, her read was unbelievable. Mm. It was just superb. She's so good. Wow, it's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, but one thing she didn't mention was her microphone, which was odd. Yeah, she, she said she has a home studio. So we're wondering if it's a top secret or whether she just thought it wasn't worth sharing. But whatever the case, she does, I'm sure, have a great sounding studio. Um, you know, for, for audiobook narration, it's tr- obviously traditional to use your typical, either a, a diaphragm, a large diaphragm condenser, or, and I know some people have a lot of success using um, like a Shure SM7B, like a dynamic mic. With the right, with, with yes, the right mic. lots brand. of gain. And, and then I know others that use a 416 or a 416, as we are calling it now. <laughs> 416. Um, <laughs> that are using it for, right. for an audiobook. And I always thought that was really out there because I thought of that mic as being a very forward and present bright microphone. And I wouldn't think you'd want to hear that for an audiobook narration, but you know what? Scott Brick, who I mentioned earlier, that's what he uses, I believe. And I know other audiobook production outfits here in Los Angeles who use that mic, and it surprised me. Well, the other thing about using a 416 is that it's so directional. And it's such a long thing to record that, you know, head movements and changes and that sound field is going to change. And it's less, it's not mm. forgiving as far as if you're going to move around in no. the booth. And so I would imagine that's just a comfort thing right. for so, the actor. So what I was thinking, and I've been talking about this for a while now, and I don't know anybody who's actually doing it, but why not use a headset microphone or sometimes known as an ear set microphone? Because you just put that on your head. And you sit down in your chair and you record. And ostensibly, it's right there with you. Um, and you don't have to, you know, vice grip your head into a specific location while you're reading. You can, you can relax. I would think that would be brilliant. And honestly, for audiobooks, they're not the quietest mics. You know, their noise floor is a little high. But, you know, for a home studio, it's going to get lost in the noise floor of the room. A little bit of downward expansion. You know, Bob's your uncle. Yeah, I've just changed microphones, speaking of the 41.6, and uh, I've just jumped in the booth on the 41.6. Very nice. But the when, thing that you, you, know, you talk, talked about it being quite toppy and, you know, c- could be brittle, um, I reckon it depends on the preamp, because this one is running through um, a Neve 1073, mm. and it just, it makes it silky quite nice. I think it works really well. And I think someone yeah. gets the voice. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Yeah, the quality be. of the but voice. It, of the it's it's the I mean, instrument always. Too, but, yeah. uh, Robert, what were you going to say about the when I was talking about headset mics? Well, you know, headset mics and like really alternate ways of thinking of mics. And one, one thing that, that, that can be done as well is a lapel microphone. And I know that sounds crazy, but, you know, a lapel mic is often an omnidirectional microphone. But keep in mind that your signal to noise ratio is key. So if you're super close to that mic, then it starts to act in a sense more directional right. because it's you don't have to have the gain as loud and then you're not fighting the noise floor mm-hmm. of the microphone as much. So um, I've, I've seen this as a great trick. And you wear a hat, your typical baseball hat, and you hang that lapel mic right over the bill of that hat. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Flap it on with a piece of tape and hang that thing right by your nose or a little bit under. I'd be amazed how, how good That's it sounds. That's not a bad idea. I've got a much better idea. With the new uh, voiceover suit, it actually comes with the voiceover <laughs> suit, helmet, and microphone all in one. <laughs> See, I, we've got it. This is big. Oh, man. We're onto something. If you could sell this as a package. <laughs> well, I was also thinking that that that, that really, if, if, if we're going for the proper, um, well, actually, it's a problem because, you know, you, you could do the whole voiceover in space and you would have no acoustic problems. Yep. But then there'd be nothing to conduct oh, the yeah, sound that's either. So that's not such a good idea. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so the voiceover suit has now become a voiceover space suit. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I don't think that's going to work. That, that'll never fly. <laughs> It'll orbit. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. 
That's right. Well, on that note, I think we should um, head off to the tailor and get those voiceover suits uh, ready for next episode. I'll be wearing mine. Wonderful. Just got to choose the colour. I'm wondering, maybe red? No, might go for a tartan, actually. Do Aurelex do tartan? Probably. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Wipe the tear, baby, dear, from your eye. Though it's hard to part, I know. I'll be tickled to death to go. Don't cry. Don't sigh. There's a silver lining in the sky. Bonsoir, old thing, cheerio, chin chin, na poo, toodaloo, goodbye.